Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Putaho Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My book, Beyond the Lines, is about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness, which is what this show is all about. My special guest today has flown on Air Force One for the past 25 years covering four presidents because he is one of the top most respected journalists in the United States. He is Chief White House Correspondent John Decker, and today we are going beyond the White House. Hey John, how's everything with you? Hey Rusty, I'm well. How are you doing? Good to talk to you. Aloha. Oh, I, I miss you, John. You know, I, I know you a few years now because of tennis, and um, I, you're so knowledgeable about tennis. And I want to ask you, John, what, what is it about tennis that you love so much? Well, it's one of those sports where it's an individual sport, and you uh, can take credit for victories, and it's also on you if you lose. And when you play the game of tennis, you can turn things around. I mean, the great thing about tennis is more than one set. Uh, and if you had a bad set, you can uh, turn things around for the second set, maybe come back from the third set and, and, and win a match. But uh, the, the thing I love about the game of tennis is uh, that you can really improve upon your game the more you practice. And uh, I just find it's also an incredible sport to watch besides playing, Rusty. And you had the, um, you're so fortunate that you've been to all these Grand Slams multiple times. So which one is your favorite? Well, I love the French Open. Uh, the French Open, Roland Garros, um, if it was going to, well, it may happen this year, we'll see, right? Uh, it's been delayed because of uh, what we're dealing with right now in our country. Uh, but uh, if indeed it happens in 2020, it will be my 18th time oh. at Roland Garros, and I just love that tournament. I love clay court tennis. I like to play on clay. I like to watch players on clay, and I've been fortunate to see Rafael Nadal, the best clay court player in history, uh, win every one of his uh, championships at Roland Garros. Uh, having said that, I, I love the other ones as well, the U.S. Open. Uh, in New York City is a great event, and uh, I, I love that at the end of the summer. And, of course, the Australian Open is a, a fun time. I've only been there one time, but I look forward to going back there. And Wimbledon, well, Wimbledon is Wimbledon. There's so much tradition associated with that tournament. Well, I, I hope you invite me to go with you on, on one of these Grand Slam tournaments, John. <laughs> now, John, I want to ask you about, you know, how your journalism career started. I mean, why did you get into journalism? Well, I uh, had an interesting uh, entry into journalism because I never studied journalism as an undergrad or grad school. I worked as a assistant press secretary for a U.S. senator named John Hines. You know John Hines from from ketchup fame, and uh, he was someone that I really looked up to. He was my home state senator from Pennsylvania, and on April the fourth of 1991, he was killed in a plane crash. And that terrible day forced me to figure out what it was I wanted to do next in my life, and. I thought long and hard about it, and, and I felt that my calling, my passion, uh, was journalism, and that's what I pursued. And that's way back in 1991, and by 1995, I was reporting from the White House, and I've been reporting from the White House ever since, and it's just been an incredible experience, Rusty, covering uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and now, of course, President Donald Trump. Man, and I know you have stories, John. <laughs> and I saw you on TV this week, um, you know, interviewing or asking some questions of, with President Trump. I mean, it's, I like that President Trump is very mindful about trying to find that balance between really, you know, controlling the virus uh, outbreak and really trying to get the, the businesses uh, going where it just doesn't really kill the economy. But what are your observations about that? Well, this is unprecedented. You know, I was uh, at the White House on 9-11 uh, and its aftermath, and this is 
you know, even beyond that in terms of this affecting uh, every American and, in fact, every citizen in the world. More than 150 countries are dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. And you're right, Rusty, the president is dealing with a health crisis, and he's dealing, in addition to that, with an economic crisis because it's impacting so many of our fellow Americans. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I am as optimistic as the president is in the sense that I am hopeful that we, if we follow these guidelines that the CDC has put out, these social distancing guidelines, adhere to them, adhere to the guidelines and rules that have been put in place by our governors and our mayors to stay in place, to shelter in place, that we can uh, defeat this and we can get back to, to life as normal. So uh, I, I, I'm of the, the mindset that uh, the, I'm supportive of the, what the president is saying uh, and I'm supportive of what our governors and local leaders are saying. We need to follow those rules and if we follow those rules, uh, we can get back to our old way of life. We can get back to our old economy, which we're zooming along uh, and we can get back to, to life. It's going to be painful, though, over the course of the next few weeks, Rusty, because clearly the, the CDC and the NIH and the president's own uh, health advisors, Dr. Anthony Fauci, in addition to Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Deborah Birx, they're, they're saying that it's going to be a very difficult time over the next few weeks in terms of fatalities, American fatalities. Yeah, John, I've been watching the news every day, and, and I love uh, seeing you on the news. <laughs> and, and um, you know, you, you've been asking, I mean, you have such great respect in the country for journalism because you ask very fair and reasonable questions. Um, why is that? <laughs> why are you so good at doing that, John? Well, I'm old school in the sense that, you know, I um, am interested in making uh, information available to the public. I want the public to get as much information as possible and helpful information to get through this or, you know, whether we're talking about uh, an issue that uh, we dealt with before the coronavirus pandemic, uh, impeachment or an executive order or learning about a Supreme Court decision. The important function, I believe, Rusty, of a journalist is to convey information to the public, information that they perhaps didn't know before, and ask the questions, Rusty, that if they were sitting where I was sitting, they would likely ask similar questions. And so that's my goal. And when I ask the uh, president the questions, I'm not trying to you know, give him a gotcha question. I just want him to provide information that will be useful, uh, useful to uh, Fox's viewing audience, useful to Fox's listening audience, and for that matter, uh, useful to uh, the entire public. Uh, and that's always been my goal, whether it's President Trump that I'm covering or whether it's uh, his predecessors, President Obama or President Bush or President Bill Clinton. Got it. That's, that's so impressive, John. And I want to ask you, what was a key moment in your in your life that really vaulted your career forward? Well, I've always worked exceptionally hard, so I, I can't point to one particular event or one particular story. You know, I, I've always treated every story when I write my stories as one that I think to myself, this story is going to be my top 100% effort, and I always apply that to every story that I write. So I, I can't point to any particular uh, event, Rusty, or, uh, or story. Uh, I, I treat each one uh, equally. And I think that uh, having that mindset, it's kind of like tennis, having that mindset, you know, in tennis, you want to treat each point uh, like it's your most important point. That's, you know, my favorite player is Rafael Nadal. If you watch him play tennis, you can tell he treats each and every point, even if he's down low 40, as if it's the most important point in the match. And that's the way that I uh, treat my, my journalism, as I treat each story in that matter. Yeah, and I, I definitely know how hard you work, John. I mean, you are, you, I mean, you're a workaholic. And I like how you uh, brought in that analogy with Nadal, because I love Nadal, too. And you're right. I mean, it doesn't matter what the score is. He could be winning, losing, or tied. 
but his right. effort and attitude is just super. I mean, it doesn't matter. And that's why he's so great at what he does. Now, John, I want to I want to talk about uh, Air Force One. <laughs> uh, how awesome and cool has it been for you to be traveling on Air Force One for the past 25 years? Well, it's 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 cool. <laughs> you know, it's, it's traveling on the same airplane as the president of the United States it is a, a real honor and it, um, you know, it's special. Uh, and so uh, I'm in a rotation with my other radio colleagues. We essentially rotate um, and to determine who's going to be filling the seat on Air Force One. And I've, you know, gone on some really remarkable trips with a number of U.S. presidents. And uh, each one is memorable. Uh, and I feel that if you get jaded, you know, in any way, Rusty, traveling on Air Force One, then you should just pack it in. You, you don't <laughs> you should be a, uh, a journalist anymore. You shouldn't be a reporter anymore. So, uh, you know, I've traveled with uh, President Trump to uh, uh, Puerto Rico in the aftermath of a very devastating uh, hurricane that hit the island, Hurricane Maria. Uh, he inspected the damage there. I traveled with President Obama uh, all the way to Israel. Uh, for the funeral of Kimmel Perez. And, uh, you know, each time I'm on there, even for a domestic trip, uh, it's very special. And, and the people that I travel with, my fellow uh, colleagues, my fellow reporters and producers that I travel with, when we're traveling on Air Force One, we all recognize how unique it is to be traveling on the presidential aircraft. Oh, that is so fascinating. John, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to continue going beyond the White House, okay? That sounds great. Thanks a lot, Leslie. You are watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, John Decker. We will be back in 60 seconds. Aloha, I'm John David Ann, the host of History Lens on Think Tech Hawaii. History Lens deals with contemporary events and looks at them through a historical perspective or what we call a history lens. Uh, the show is streamed live on thinktechhawaii.com. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo and aloha. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My special guest today is one of the top most respected journalists in the United States. He is Chief White House Correspondent John Decker, and today we are going beyond the White House. John, you know, it seems to me that President Trump likes you, and, and he doesn't like too many people, it seems, in, in the White House press corps, but I think he he respects you, um, you know, for all of these years, actually. and. What are your thoughts about that? Well, I first interviewed uh, President Trump way before he was president. I interviewed him for the first time back in 1999. And I interviewed him for a book that I wrote called Great Dads. And he was in that book uh, telling me uh, why his father made such an impact on him. And he really liked that story. So I, I think that that uh, has it had an impact in terms of the way that he uh, views me. But he also knows that when he calls on me at press conferences, he's not going to get a softball. Uh, he's going to get a fair question. And I do treat the president with respect. Uh, uh, every president is deserving of respect. And uh, I think that is one of the reasons why uh, the president typically calls on me when he has a press conference. and. Uh, and, and I think long and hard about what it is I'm going to ask the president. And it's not, you know, uh, off the top of my head. I, I think about a question that uh, will perhaps move the move, a news cycle in some way uh, or uh, provide some information to the public that perhaps they did not know before. And so that works into what I uh, ultimately 
uh, ask the president in formulating a question. Now, John, what, I mean, because you've covered four presidents, I mean, they all have different styles. I mean, is there one style that's more effective than another, or are they all effective? Well, I, obviously, to achieve the, the presidency, to win the White House, uh, you have to be doing something pretty special. And so uh, Bill Clinton, who served two terms, and George W. Bush, who served two terms, Barack Obama, who served two terms, uh, Donald Trump, who's hoping to serve two terms, they actually obviously connected uh, with the American people uh, you know, in such a way that they, they won the keys to the Oval Office. And so each of those presidents that I've covered, uh, the past four presidents, they each have their own style. Uh, president Trump, our, our current president, uh, is very unique in terms of taking questions as often as he does from the press corps. And you may not like the answers he gives, but he is uh, answering questions on almost a daily basis. Before we dealt with this terrible coronavirus pandemic, uh, you know, the president would typically stop uh, before he aborted Marine One and uh, would take questions from the press corps that had gathered to see him off of Marine One. And that's just not anything that we have seen before. You know, Barack Obama, President Obama did not do that. George W. Bush did not do that. Uh, president Clinton did not do that. So that's very unique to President Trump. And then when the president meets with guest visitors in the Oval Office, he'll take questions there. Uh, when he meets with visitors in the cabinet room or the Roosevelt room, uh, he'll take questions there. So he's pretty unique uh, in that regard. And, and I think hopefully, uh, regardless of who the next president is and when we get the next president, you know, it could be in 2021 or 2025, uh, the, the next president uh, follows that same uh, pattern of providing ample opportunities for the press corps to ask questions to the president. Oh, that's fascinating how accessible President Trump is. And I want to I want to ask you, John, I, you know, I know that you're the only attorney among all of the chief I mean, out of all of the White House press corps, right? I mean, for, I mean, you're an attorney, the only right. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it certainly came uh, in handy most recently covering the impeachment of President Trump. This is the second impeachment that I covered because I covered the impeachment of Bill Clinton as well. And having that uh, background uh, as an attorney, as a member of the uh, DC bar, uh, comes in handy, explaining sometimes difficult legal issues uh, to the public, uh, explaining difficult legal issues to our audience. And so uh, I have often been called upon uh, to explain those issues, whether you're talking about impeachment or executive orders or Supreme Court cases uh, or uh, Supreme Court decisions to the public. And my background as a lawyer uh, and being a person who can explain sometimes difficult legal concepts to the public obviously helps in uh, explaining those uh, difficult legal concepts to the public. And so uh, it's very useful to me. And in fact, most recently, uh, Rusty, I taught a course at UCLA Law School uh, on impeachment. Uh, so perfect timing to teach such a course. And uh, I really enjoyed that opportunity uh, which took place at the very beginning of this year. No, it's definitely an advantage to have that law background that you have and, and how lucky of those UCLA students to have someone like you teaching that class. And John, I want to ask you about, you know, you mentioned your book, um, Great Dads. And, you right. know, you're among, um, out of everything that you do, you're also an author. I mean, it's, it's amazing what you do, John. Um, why did you write this book, Great Dads? Well, as you see from the title, it says, As Seen in Reader's Digest. And so I, uh, in the late 1990s, had a friend that uh, was an editor at Reader's Digest. And he asked me if I was interested in writing a, an article for Reader's Digest for their Father's Day issue on that subject. Great dads, uh, finding some interesting men and women talking about lessons they learned from their fathers. 
And I did that. And another friend of mine that uh, was a writer for the New York Times happened to see that. And he said to me, you know, that would make a great book. And I hadn't thought about that, actually. And he said, let me give you uh, a connection uh, with my literary agent. And so that's what my friend did. And the literary agent, in turn, uh, pitched the idea to a number of publishers. And we got a, a book deal, which was very fortunate. And then I had uh, this great opportunity to interview Rusty, so many interesting people, um, uh, about lessons they learned from their fathers. People from politics, like George W. Bush and Al Gore and John McCain and Kathleen Kennedy Townsend about her father, Robert Kennedy. Uh, people from sports like Kobe Bryant and Mike Ditka and John McEnroe and Chrissy Everett uh, and Phil Mickelson. Uh, people from business like Donald Trump and Jeff Bezos. Uh, and uh, people from the entertainment world like Jay Leno. And so this was a, a really awesome opportunity to interview uh, some interesting people about lessons they learned uh, from their fathers and lessons that in some cases they're imparting upon their own children. And it's interesting, I, I look at that book every once in a while, it's been a while since it's published, but Dr. Anthony Fauci is also another interesting person that I interviewed for uh, the book Great Dads. And I'll tell you an interesting story, Rusty, uh, a few years back, uh, I saw Dr. Fauci uh, in the green room uh, when he and I were going to be doing separate segments on MSNBC. And we got talking, and of course, you remember when I interviewed him for uh, the book, and he said, he told me, he said, my father died a few years ago, uh, and I read the story that you wrote about my father as the eulogy at his funeral. Wow. And I was very very touched by that and obviously made me feel very good. And, and, and he obviously uh, felt that what he conveyed to me in our interview is something that he wanted to convey to others uh, at his father's funeral. So that's a, a nice connection that I have with one of the foremost uh, experts in infectious diseases in the entire world. Wow, what an honor. I mean, that your book is very fascinating. I, I love your book, John. and. You know, I, I know how hard it is to write books. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. you know, in, I, I'm glad you like my book, you know, Beyond the Lines. And I got to get you my second book, Beyond the Game, now. And I want to ask you, John, in my book, I talk a lot about uh, building relationships. And, you know, through your career, you've had to build tons of relationships. What's the key to building great relationships? I think the key really, no matter what you're talking about in business or in life, is to be yourself and be honest. And I think that goes a long way towards building friendships uh, with uh, people that you can do business with or people that you hope to make your friends. And uh, that's always served me well. I consider you a, a very good friend, Rusty. And you share that same quality that so many of my other friends share, and that is uh, just real honesty and um, the real deal. And that's that's what I look for in friends. And I think that goes a long way for anybody, uh, no matter where you are in this country or any country for that matter, in terms of succeeding. Oh, thank you. I, I feel the same way towards you, John. <laughs> and. John, I want to ask you about success. How how do you define success? Oh, I, I don't know. There's there's so many different ways to define success. I I think that um, an important and I, I'm a, I'm a professor as well. I think you know that. Well, we just talked about UCLA Law School, and I teach a, a class um, every fall semester at Georgetown and. If I can impart some lessons to the next generation, uh, no matter what it is that they pursue, whether it's law students pursuing uh, the law or uh, young undergraduate students at Georgetown that may pursue um, journalism or, or, for that matter, graduate school, if I can impart something that they can take in the next step in their life, that, that to me is, is achieving success. And, uh, it always makes me feel really good, Rusty, when I see a former student, um, 
an anchor that is a former student on CNN or a former uh, student uh, that I had at Georgetown doing exceptionally well in whatever field that they are, and, and I hear about that. And not that I'm responsible for their success, but it just makes me uh, feel good that you know I have a small part in terms of their achieving that road to success. And so that is just one way that I would define that. I love hearing that, John. And I want to know, John, who are some people that inspire you? Well, I only have one picture uh, in my office, and you're in my home office right now, uh, of a journalist, and that's Walter Cronkite. Uh, Walter, uh, I have a picture of, of, of me and Walter Cronkite. And, uh, you know, he is someone that I think everybody should look up to if you're in the field of uh, journalism. Uh, he's certainly someone I looked up to, uh, and he just embodied uh, everything that I think a journalist should strive for, uh, which is uh, telling it like it is, which is the, the catchphrase that he often is associated with, and being honest uh, with his viewers. And to me, that's what I want to do every day, is to tell it like it is, and to be honest with uh, my Fox audience and others that may be watching or listening. And to me, that is a role model in terms of the field that, that I pursue. Well, I think you are the modern day Walter Cronkite, John, in my mind, that's for sure. <laughs> and John, I want to ask you, what's the best advice you've ever received in your life? Oh, gosh, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've had I've had some some mentors, uh, someone who made news uh, over the course of the past half year or so is a mentor of mine. That's Jonathan Turley, who is a law professor at George Washington uh, Law School, and you may have seen him during the impeachment trial. He was one of the uh, experts that testified, and uh, he is someone that uh, I have always admired. And he was a professor of mine in law school, and uh, to me, uh, you know, I, I I always read the columns that he writes because he's just so insightful about so many different things. So in the field of uh, of law, he is definitely a mentor of mine. But I've had mentors of, of all different types. Uh, there's a, a mentor who is a, 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 a prominent uh, Republican lawyer named Bobby Birchfield. Uh, who I, I reach out to, another mentor who is on the opposite end of the uh, political uh, spectrum, uh, named L.D. Atchison, uh, the granddaughter of Dean Atchison, from this, he used to serve as the uh, Secretary of State for the United States. So, uh, to me, I, I, you know, look up to people regardless of where they fall uh, on the political spectrum. Uh, and I find things that I can take from them uh, that I can perhaps use in what I do on a regular basis and the way that I live my life. And uh, in addition to all that, you know, my, my wife, she is uh, so remarkable, you know, in terms of everything that she uh, does, her work, her work ethic. And uh, I'm, I'm always uh, amazed by the way that she uh, goes about doing all the things that she does on a, on a regular basis. John, you and your wife, Caroline, you guys make a great team, and I'm so proud that I got to meet her, you know, last year. Yep. And, John, yep. I, I love hearing your insights and really want to thank you for taking time to be on the show today and just know that I want more John Deckers in the world. Uh, that's the nicest thing I've heard uh, in quite some time. That's really nice of you, Rusty. Uh, I always appreciate it. I appreciate your friendship, too. And I'm so glad I could finally, in, in, in large part because of uh, this coronavirus pandemic and uh, the fact that I'm working from home, I could finally be on your show. So yeah. what, a, what, what a silver lining that is in terms of uh, working at home and being able to be on your show, Rusty. Uh, it, it's a real great honor. Well, thank you, John, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? I look forward to it. Thanks a lot, Rusty. Aloha. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykamori.com. And my book is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble.
I hope that John and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.